Hi, and welcome to Lost in Criteria, the show where I, Adam Glass, and my good friend... J. Patrick Dorgan. I always do a little a little twirly point when I do that, as if I'm tossing it to you and we're in the same studio, even the back. Though you're <laughs> half a world away, 14 well, time zones on the other side of the world. Well, um, if, if you want to know, I always forget that you're going to do it. And always have like a 30... <laughs> there's seriously a five-second pause on my end where I'm like... Oh, I'm supposed to talk now. Oh, yeah, you're, I'm supposed to talk. Um, anyway, so, this is show, Lost in Criterion, where we talk about the Criterion Collection. We're going in order, and right now we're going to discuss movie number seven, A Night to Remember. Roy Ward... Roy, I can't talk. <laughs> Roy Ward Baker uh, made this in 1958. It's a docudrama about the Titanic, based on a nonfiction book. This is the second take, because Pat's an idiot... Yes, and I accidentally, accidentally deleted saved the file. over his file. Yeah. So, um, hopefully it'll be a little cleaner and a lot less ums and ahs and eh and pauses. And mm, I don't think it's going to be that good. Well, I was just trying to get rid of all of my pause noises before we got into this. Oh, I see. Should I do a lot of coughing right now and grunting? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe brush the microphone a few times, get that out of the way too. All right. So this is this is about the Titanic, as I said. It is considered the most historically accurate portrayal of the Titanic disaster ever put to film. That includes 1997's James Cameron movie, as well as the 2012 re-release of James Cameron's movie in retroactive 3D. Which it's important <laughs> to note, as we stated in the previous version of this recording, neither of us has actually seen. Yes. I have not seen all of James Cameron's uh, delightful four-hour epic. Is it really four um, hours long? No, I don't think it's quite that okay. long. Um, I just remember that every every set of it I've seen on on VHS takes up VHS two has tapes. Been, yeah. oh, has been two man. tapes. That's a nightmare. And I, and I've looked, and there's no like supplemental material on those two tapes. It's just the movie on two tapes. So I have to imagine it's fairly long, um, but. But I only ever made it through tape one. I've never um, seen any of it. No, at I've all. never, I've never attempted to sit down and watch it. It's been on television. and I've caught clips of it when it has been on. Te- well, I think it was on television once. But nonetheless, I have caught clips of it before. I've been Probably around while TBS. other people have been watching it, but I have not been watching it. But such a cultural milestone as it was, I think Pat and I both know pretty much what happens. Well. Um, also considering the fact that I think everybody knows what happened to the Titanic. Yeah, it's 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 our yeah no like it's it's like uh so like, yeah when uh when uh that that Jesus movie came out. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you really blanked on that one. The Passion of yeah, the Christ. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, the Passion of the Christ came out, and uh, I was I was at church, and a church a group of people from the church was going to see it, or or was talking about it actually, and asked if I had seen it yet. And I said, because eh, they didn't want to spoil it for me. What's their justification? <laughs> and I said, go ahead. I've read the book. I'm a little familiar with the source material. I, I know the story. We're sitting at church wondering wondering if they can spoil a movie about Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for me. Uh, I think I probably know a little bit about that already. <laughs> I really like the idea of like, being, no, you're going to ruin it for me. Don't tell me what happens. Yes. Don't tell me what happens. Wait, does he does he die? On a cross? Oh, man, that's ridiculous. That would actually be, so, like, other than the fact that it would probably get you beat up, that would be a very fun movie to go to and just yell, The boulder's gonna move! <laughs> or something like that, like, pretend like you're ruining it for everybody. Yeah. Like you're not. Yeah. No, it'd be great. That's, that's, that's another movie I still haven't actually seen. So. You know, I, I, anyway. I did, I can't. Really, honestly, there's enough room for interpretation. I don't actually remember how it was interpreted like so there you go i don't remember right. i don't remember what the stop points in the beginning point is. Eh, yeah let's move on Who we knows? don't need to talk about the passion of the Christ. we've we've spent we've spent four minutes talking about movies that aren't the movie we're here to discuss <laughs> so and you were worried right. we were gonna go too fast <laughs> as i said as i said um this was uh directed by roy ward baker um, it is based on a non-fiction book by an author whose name I can't remember and for some reason forgot to write down. And for some reason, uh, but I managed to forget the second time as well. Yes. It's, still it's a Lord something. Uh, but, uh, but the book is, the book is by the, uh, is of the same title. Um, 
I like to remember. And actually, it's it's interesting. There was a Titanic in the early 50s, I think 53, um, made by Paramount, an American production, um, that isn't nearly as remembered, probably because it's not nearly as, as good. But uh, the author of the book thanks Paramount uh, for being an invaluable uh, source for other sources, for people to interview, for people to to uh, talk to. Interesting. And, and for research material. Um, so apparently Paramount put a lot of work into it that, that helped this guy write his book. Um, anyway, By the I'd way, like his name off. is Walter Lords. I got it backwards. Walter Lords. There we go. There so we he go. has Thank a you title for, for his last name. Yes. I would, have, I would have looked it up, but my keyboard is very loud. Yes. Demonstrating. Ah, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> He's writing the great American novel as we, as we speak. Yes. So, um, <laughs> very distracted in this second take. Uh, Pat, you ruined everything. I'm sorry. With, just with a quote from that nonfiction book about, because uh, Lord says that when he wrote the book, that there was relatively little interest in the Titanic tragedy, and this would have been you know 1955 or so, um, so 40 years after the disaster, 50 years ago, um, well 60 years ago I suppose now. What year is it? Um, what? 2012. I have right? no idea. <laughs> um. So, relatively low interest, um, which is surprising because the magnitude of this tragedy has always struck me as, as, as something, to say, uh, something to remember. And I suppose, though, in my lifetime, I mean, obviously in 1997, James Cameron brought it back to the forefront, and in 1987, when they discovered the wreckage, uh, it was a big news thing. So, there's been cultural points about it. Yeah, like, um, I mean, that's the thing is, like, all throughout my life wouldn't be that when you consider the other things that happened in that century yeah there's certainly reasons to were have. even more traumatic it's kind of yeah. not hard to realize that yeah we all probably just forgot about it yeah that's the past the past is a foreign country i suppose in in my mind the titanic is a disaster and maybe not on the magnitude of World War One and World War Right, II, exactly. Like time, those things they're are all things. just yeah. They're all just historical artifacts to me. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Anyway, so I'd like to kick off with uh, with a note from Lords from the book uh, that I found in some of the essays with the Criterion Collection edition. Um, a little bit edited, actually. There's a lot of ellipses in this. But <clears throat> at the same time, it is why he thinks it is a tale to be remembered and a tale we'll be obsessed with. And I agree with him, which is why it's surprising to me, especially when he says that in 1955, no one was as interested. But, quote, What troubled people especially was not just the tragedy, or even its needlessness, but the element of fate in it all. If the Titanic had heeded any of the six ice warnings, uh, ice messages on Sunday, if ice conditions had been normal, if the night had been rough or moonlit, if she had seen the berg 15 seconds sooner or 15 seconds later, if she had hit the ice any other way, if her watertight bulkheads had been one deck higher, if she had carried enough boats, if the Californian, just 10 miles away, had only come, had any one of these ifs turned out right every life might have been saved but they all went against her it's a classic greek tragedy and obviously we're always obsessed with the greek tragedy form which is why we it still exists three thousand years on was that part of the quote or 5, no years on. no that wasn't part of oh, the okay. quote. that was my commentary at the end i'm sorry classic greek tragedy end quote Sorry, I just got a bit blah, lost. Blah, blah. You know, he like maybe it's this, okay. this I, Walter I, Lord guy started ambiguous. to ramble a little bit there toward the end of his quote. Yeah, it was it was it was ambiguous. I ruined everything there, but not as bad as you. No, that's impossible. 
No. All right. So this is a movie. Um, it's it's marketed as more not marketed. It's it's said to be more historic accurate, principally um, because of the social stratification. I think obviously in Cameron's movie we have the the overarching love story of Jack and Rose. Jack being from steerage, Rose being from first class, and they meet each other and they fall in love and Jack sneaks upstairs and Rose sneaks downstairs and blah, 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 blah. This movie doesn't deal with that sort of thing. One, this movie doesn't have any specific protagonists in a way. Uh, if we have any, it's the uh, second officer um, who we, we, we bookend the movie kind of with him. Um... And he gets he gets the most poignant lines, but at the same time, the ship is kind of the protagonist, and everyone else is is really window dressing, and that's not to this movie's detriment at all. I don't want to I don't want to suggest that, but um, we certainly have, and we'll talk about this a lot. There is no mixing of class, or at least not until the very well, end. and and yeah. as. We will we will talk about I'm sure a lot more. That's really a more appropriate and historically accurate representation yeah. of exactly. the era than the crazy James Cameron love fest. That is that is how how things were, and that is that is why it is portrayed like that. And to an extent, it is I guess a social commentary, just pointing out the fact that things were like that. I think, and so different from how they are today is itself an inherent judgment on that. Um, and certainly when we get to the end and things are so stratified that steerage is being locked in there. Well, uh, yeah, while well, first and second class areas. get to abandon ship, they're being yeah. locked downstairs. Yeah. For Really, when you think about it, no real conceivable reason. I mean, there's yeah. no... I mean, we don't seem to have a legitimate reason why the women and children can't be taken out of yeah. steerage. It's not that, like, yeah. it would cause pandemonium. That's already happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we get into this sort of thing where, like, are they just not allowed up in second and first class while there might still be second and first class people there? Yeah. And, which, yeah. and that really... It, it is very difficult for us as modern... Uh, like Americans with modern American thoughts to conceive of the idea that like first class means anything more than you spent a lot of money to buy your ticket. Yeah. And luxury. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't think of nobody on an airplane thinks of first class passengers as a different breed of humans. Yes. With more rights than, than the coach passengers. Indeed. Though I'm, I'm sure there are people in first class who, who still right, do but I like think that. that's more of a. It, it's it is definitely, definitely a one-way street. Yeah, yeah. No one. There's nobody. Yeah. There's yeah. nobody in coach on an airplane bowing, scraping before <laughs> their betters. Exactly. Exactly. And and if if anyone in coach, you know, believes believes that they are somehow below the people in first class, it would be an a point of anger, not a point of submission. It would be them accusing first class of believing falsely that they are better. Yeah, than exactly. So it's, um, it's, it, I mean, again, yeah, you get into the past of the foreign country thing. It's impossible. Yeah. Whereas, to whereas in this, this, yeah, in this movie, steerage is accepting of where they are. Yeah. They are the lower class. And that's, that's, I mean, obviously as, as death is more eminent, they become more angry, and they end up breaking out of... I mean, a few of them sneak out a back way and, and kind of wander through the ship trying to get upstairs. Um, and there is a point where they reach the first-class dining room on their, on their sweep through the ship, and they pause. Um, one, I think, perhaps because of the grandeur of it, mm. and it's not something they're used to seeing. But at the same time, there's this sense of... I shouldn't be even doing though this. Yeah. yeah, even though they're making their escape, there's a sense of, we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't have access to this. Um, and that's, that's cemented earlier in dialogue when a couple from Steerage are walking around on the first-class decks, and no one's... No, no one's talking to them. 
they're not actively ignoring them. They're not looking at them and sneering. They're not saying, oh, you're... <laughs> Steerage. <laughs> they're not being they're not being your typical first class. <laughs> but but the people from steerage themselves decide that they need to go back, that this isn't where they belong, and they need to go back below deck. Yeah, I mean there's definitely an element of self imposition in this entire system that we see being portrayed. And uh, yeah, yeah, as you point out, it they but it's not a system that bothers anybody involved until yeah. it becomes a matter of life and death. And then it is a, yeah. and then suddenly it becomes very much like, well, this is not right. But up until that moment, yeah. it's, well, this is just the way things are. Yeah. So, you know, in a general theme about that, um, I, mean, I mentioned that the second officer seems to be our protagonist character. And in that regard... You know, I think Titanic really mirrors World War One in the way we, we, we change things. And he says at the end that even though it's all happened, it still seems unbelievable. And he doesn't, eh, I don't think I'll ever be sure again about anything. Um, because the Titanic was so established as, as being this great, grandest, grand wall thing. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's still, it's fallible. And he's he's now viewing everything as fallible, and it's very much British British modernism, and we get into postmodernism. But this this idea that you know the institutions are no longer um, that we viewed as fallible are not or as infallible are not that they they deserve to be broken down because they are broken. They need to be destroyed. And World War One did that a lot, and we saw that with our first our first movie that we watched. Um, where the the aristocracy uh, was clearly falling apart, and it was it was the everyman. Yeah, game now. well, I think like it's somehow a, a theme that seems to run in sort of this. Well, it seems to be running heavy in cinema in general, but well, yeah, and that's that's obviously because it's a theme that has run in humanity since 1912, since World War One, since the Titanic. Uh, it is a theme that has run in humanity as cinema has grown up. Yeah. So it is. It is obviously something that gets gets played a lot in in our modern society and in in twentieth century society specifically because it was the changes that were being made during the twentieth century. And the twentieth century was all about evening it out, and it's still about because that's what postmodernism is: the fact that. You know, modernism decided that these things were infallible and they need to be broken down, and postmodernism is about how, well, what we broke them down into is still, still needs breaking, that there's no fixing it. Yeah, and then post postmodernism but, is, well, we have to do it anyway, even if it is yes, broken. Yes. <laughs> and that's kind of where we are now. But, but there's definitely this, this sort of, you know, Prior, and, and I never really thought about, until watching this, I never really thought about the Titanic as a point of this as well, because World War One is obviously the major turning point in culture in, in, in the early 20th century, the, the major switch from aristocracy to, to more democratic in a way, um, at least ideally. Um, but the Titanic definitely has it there too, because we're, we've got, we've got, the stratification, and then everybody's equal. Everybody is facing death here. And everybody is uh, doing so uh, surprisingly. That's one thing this movie is very good about. And throughout is showing that every person, no matter well, where they are on the ship, minor... believes the ship is Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a definite thing. I thought you were going to get into the point that for a, a large majority of the people, also, I thought this is what you're getting into. Take their death with this ship in stride. It's really yeah. impressive yeah. to watch no. the sort of stalwartness of even the general populace yeah, on the ship. But you know, I think you know it's important to note that the incredible stalwartness of the crew, but even the general populace. Yeah for the most part in the film, seem to take the women and children first thing very seriously. Yeah, 
Yeah, there are there are a few instances where that. Yeah, there are a few people, uh, but they are not shown true. to be oddities. Yes. They are, but they are they are they are supposed to be cowards. Yes, there is a man dressed as a woman. There is the uh, the the bald guy with the mustache, which he's the head of the White Star Line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a, he's like yeah. yeah the banker. Yeah, he uh, he gets on board. A life, a life and, well before yeah, and he is someone shown in his position be, should have. Yeah, he is shown to be a coward, and in in the movie makes yes. it very clear that the people who do that are cowards. But uh, like I said, yeah, I find it most impressive that the crew there is there aren't any. Yeah, every single a lot of a lot of the crew is completely nonchalant about yeah. it. Um, like when the when the stewards are woken up and told that the ship is sinking. They uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they just go yeah, back to like, bed. Get out of they, here. We're busy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're all, they, they think they throw things. At yeah, I think they throw some bread or something. Um, yeah, um, from their glory hole. Yes, the, 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 <laughs> what the, the apple. What the door says, they call it the glory hole. It's, uh, I don't yeah. know. Uh, I don't think it's. The past is a foreign yeah, country. I that probably, don't think maybe it means that means thing, something yeah. different to them. <laughs> anyway, um, but what I, what I was meaning to say, um, I completely, completely lost I am where I was so going. I'm so sorry. Um, social stratification, you know, this, this, oh yeah, the change in beliefs, um, is so poignant in this movie, uh, because we go from believing wholeheartedly in the, the structure, in, in the systems, uh, in the ship. Yeah. And, and everybody, Everybody, to a point where it's certainly played for irony in the movie. Uh, but from the very beginning, we've got this, as they're, sh- as they're christening the ship, uh, they're sending it off with, with this unsinkable, you know, it, the ship itself is infallible. Um, <clears throat> and they send it off, and we immediately cut, and we meet our, our second officer, and he is on a train, a, a pinnacle of achievement from an earlier generation, um, talking about the ship. And he makes some joke about it. And he's reading a, he's reading a soap ad. And yeah. I think what... Uh, yeah. I, the, what, did, what did the ad say? It was just talking about the toilet. Oh, it's, it's like how they, the they do at the top of the top. Yeah, just the best possible... Yes. In first class, they have the absolute yeah. greatest soap ever made by man. Yes, and he's he's making fun of that aspect of it, and the guy to his wife, and the the gentleman sharing the train car with them uh, attacks him for it and tells him tells him that it's it's disrespectful to the country. Yeah, it really gives him to quite a tongue lashing for it. Yeah, to to, <laughs> to talk ill of the uh, of the of the Titanic. Because it's such the pinnacle of achievement for the nation, and uh, he's talking bad about it. And and throughout the movie, everybody, um, you know, there's there's a really great moment um, when they're rousing people. When the captain's finally decided that the ship is actually sinking, and they're they're rousing people, um, and and it shows it shows both both what I'm talking about and more the social stratification, uh, because like. First class, uh, everybody gets like a handwritten invitation to leave. Yeah, the ship. it's like sure if you would <laughs> somebody be so knocks kind on the door. To join us by the lifeboats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah, very quietly, very calmly presents it, and you know from that moment until the ship is actually going underwater, first class, almost universally, resolutely believes that this is like a drill. That they're going to go on the lifeboats for 20 minutes, and then everyone's going to get back on the boat, and it's going to continue sailing in New York, and they'll be fine. Yeah, they treat it very much as a um, formality. Like, oh, wow, well, like if we yeah. have to get off the boat. It's like, there's a yeah. few and, characters and, who seem to understand the magnitude of the situation, but they are few yeah. and far between, I would yeah. say. And we'll talk, talk about them more in a second. I do want to, the, the, since I got into it, I want to I wanna take away that aside. Uh, the the social stratification there. Second class then gets a guy knocking on the door, but it's not like somebody waking them up and, and coming in and very apologetically. Um, second class, the the families um, 
it gets explained to them, but really just, you know, just almost almost as informally as well it, it, possible for who they are. Yeah, I mean, they get the second yeah. class get a. I mean, they get better. They yeah. mean they get decent. You know, I mean, they get you know kind yeah. of police come outside. But they, they kind of thing. They're still left with the impression. I mean, and it's it's just as much their personal beliefs as the way it's presented to them. But they're still left with the impression that this is a temporary thing. Um, and then the guy presenting it to Steerage, is just yelling. In yeah, the he's hallway, not even knocking on it. Get off the boat. Yeah. Get off the yeah, boat. Get on your life jacket. Head to the yeah, life Get on your life jacket. Put on your life jackets. Put on your life jackets. Just yelling. And then gets into an argument with a guy who doesn't speak English and just, like, punches him. Isn't, <laughs> is that where we get to the crew right after that? Is I think that's the next I think, scene is yeah, where we get to the crew in. where he just screams at him, get the hell out of bed. And they scream back, and that's the yeah. end of, like, we see the whole sequence <laughs> yes. moving through every social structure. Because, yeah. you know, really the stewards yeah, are the everything. lowest rung of the social structure. Yeah. Yeah. But there is, one of my favorite lines in the movie also establishes that, you know, obviously obviously with the way we've uh, presented things so far, um, with the pre-credit sequence and then those early scenes established that prior to the boat launching, everybody believed, you know, it was unsinkable. But one of my favorite lines in the movie actually uh, cements that uh, the ship designer, uh, Thomas Andrews, uh, and why why you would allow someone with two first names to design <laughs> an unsinkable boat. Them. I, you, no wonder you can't it's saying. with two first names. No wonder. Anyway, uh, he basically decides, uh, he's, he, he sees what's going on. And he knows that his masterpiece is dead, so he is the first to steadfastly say, "We're going, we're going down." Um, and even the captain can't believe him. Like at that yeah, very even first the introduction, the captain's like, "That can't possibly be true," or something to that effect. And he's like, "No, I've done the math. We're going to go down. It's just a matter of yeah, time." Yeah. And yeah. And and makes a point to say, and that time's not very yeah, it's long. Yeah, like, we're looking at like what, like an hour? I think it was two hours. You said, yeah, two hours. I think is what they say. Uh, so anyway, one of my one of my favorite little moments is they are discussing how many people are on the ship, and there's two thousand two hundred and six. I think is is what they decide, or that's how many people are listed. Um, and now they, then they ask how many uh, how many boats there are. Uh, how many lifeboats? And there's enough lifeboats for about 1,200. And Andrews just looks at the captain, like, how how on earth could we possibly have let this happen? Yeah. And the captain responds with, I don't think the uh, I don't think the trade organizations, the, the people in charge of checking those safeties, I don't think they uh, saw this coming, is essentially what he Which, says. when you think about it, is kind of a dumbfounding thing in itself, because if yeah. a boat sinks, a boat sinks... They don't half sink. Yeah. You know what exactly. I mean? So I kind of wonder exactly. myself, it's like, really, so why, like, putting, why would you put half? What's the purpose? Yeah. Putting enough, putting on, putting enough with half, for half the passengers is essentially the same as putting enough for none of Exactly. The because, yeah, again, boats don't half sink. And if yeah. it half sinks, just put all the people in the half that hasn't sank and ride that home. Yeah, well, I guess I guess maybe one justification for that is if you get half the people off Perhaps the boat onto their sink. own boats, maybe maybe there'll be enough extra buoyancy that uh, that the boat won't sink all the way and they can make yeah, it. Well. <laughs> but I don't think anyone thinks about it that no, deeply. No, I think they just. So. I don't. I think the lifeboats are basically a formality, and and they yeah. kind of make that point like with that little exchange, like well. I don't think they yeah. thought about this eventuality. Well, clearly, they didn't. Yeah. No. No one did. And that's that's where we are. Um, so we get a whole bunch of uh, people steadfastly refusing to get on the lifeboats, even at the beginning, and, and men convincing their wives to go, thinking that they'll see see their wives. And and there's a great, there's a great, you know, there's moments, you know, obviously as, as the night gets goes on and things get more desperate and it's more clear that 
that they are going to die. Um, there's a bunch of very stoic goodbyes from the people getting on the boats at last. And we have that, that second-class family that we see um, where the husband uh, puts the wife on and says goodbye to the children very, very desperately lying to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. About how they'll see each other again. Just trying his hardest yeah. to make them not he is, understand. Yeah, he is trying to sell yeah. that. <laughs> and he he so clearly doesn't believe it himself. Um, but you you end up admiring just, characters like that because he's doing a good thing. Yeah, Because, yeah, like, obviously. would his children obviously. and wife go if they yeah. knew that there was no way in hell they were ever going to see him again? Yeah. And that's that's certainly what we're supposed to take away from that, and what we do take away from that is is that he, what he is doing is admirable. It is an admirable lie to convince the wife that he is safe in order that she will allow herself to be saved. Um, and yeah, you know, we, in contrast to that, but still, still an admirability. Um, we have the uh, the Strausses, Isidore and Ida Strauss, uh, who there's actually like four statues of in New York City. Um, really? They were, yeah. Isidore was the co-founder of Macy's, and his wife, um, they were like 80 at this point. I mean, they were they were very old folk um, and been married for, for years, and you know, it's women and children first, so so they're trying to, the, the crew is trying to coat Ida onto a lifeboat, and she essentially says, I mean, she, and this is before, this is even before the majority of people um, have realized just the, the enormousness of the, of the threat. Um, but she is still, you know, accepting of, of her death, and she's, she says, I've never left my husband's side before, why should I now? And they, they hold hands, and, and, Go yeah, die, and it's basically. really interesting that we are put in a situation where we end up admiring both types of characters, but we do. We admire them for mm -hmm. different reasons, but they're both doing it. both sets yeah. of characters, and we do see this contrast with other sets of characters as well, where they are doing yeah. admirable things that are completely opposite yeah. of each other. Everybody, everybody, for the most part, people do admirable things, and that is that is one. One other reason that you know, the Titanic is such a you know, will live on in human memory is that not only is it a monument to human hubris, um, it is also a point where, at our lowest moments, when everything else has failed us, there are still there are still points of chivalry yeah i mean points like of, uh, points to be especially like i brought up before like i found you know the crew is just and what we see yeah. from what you know this is a historically accurate movie and there's no accounts of a crew the crew abandoning their charges in fact the every crew member seems to go about his duty to the last possible second to the best of his ability and we see that in this film and you end up at least yeah. personally I ended up admiring the crew probably more than any other sets of characters yeah especially you end up with like your uh, the, the uh, first mate and things like and characters like him who really like push it to the last second yeah they're pushing that last light boat yeah. out into the water as they go under yeah yeah um and it's interesting, there is one moment, though, where that is the the sense of duty the crew has, I, I think is, I think Baker is calling into question it. Um, we get one pan, and it's really short, and it's a blink-if-you-miss-it sort of thing, but we've got all of the little bag boys, the, the kids in their little round hats hmm. and jackets, um... <laughs> All of them, uh, I mean, they would be first class. I don't know. I don't even know what they would be doing on the ship, but they're clearly employed on the ship. And we're talking young boys. These these kids were clearly under 10 years old. But they are also part of the crew. And as part of the crew, they will go down with the ship. So they are all just huddled together. See, I missed corner. that. I didn't see that at all. Yeah. No, that is that is definitely in there. And those kids did not make a boat. 
women and children first did not apply to the crew. Then. Well, yeah, I mean, be, um, be, yeah, I didn't, I missed that scene, but at the same time, yeah, they are part of the crew, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, at the same time, they, they are, they are, as they are boys, but they are still people making a living, so perhaps they are, are meant to be men in our view. But, yeah, that was, that was certainly, that was a little bit of an emotional moment. Um, there is one other crew member who doesn't, we, we touch a few, but there's one other crew member who kind of loses it in a way, but not, not to anyone's real detriment. And that's the head baker. Yeah. yeah. And he talks, we don't get his name in here, but he talks to, uh, Andrews and Andrews convinces him that the ship is going down. Um, and he immediately goes back to his room and drinks nearly a full bottle of Johnny Walker. Um, and then for the rest of the movie, he is the comic relief, drunkenly stumbling around, heading down a corridor and finding water and turning around and going back to his room for another drink, even as his room is flooding. And he ends up on deck throwing chairs off the deck for people to use which as flotation devices. W- yeah, which is one of the more ama- like he is the comic relief, but he also kind of even emphasizes the yeah. point: this man is drunk out of his mind, and he is still helping other people. <laughs> he is yes, still doing and he's something. Still helping good. other people. Yeah, and while we don't we don't get his full story in the movie, um, because well we can't. Yeah, we can't uh, focus on every single but, person. What what happened to this guy, um, according to his account and according to, to what we have as a historic record, uh, he ended up, he claims, he rode the very tip of the ship down into the water. Um, so he, he was the last passenger of the HMS Titanic to the point, and then treaded water in the North Atlantic for two hours before a boat found him. Um, now we we see in the movie that boat finding him. It's uh, it's the overturned lifeboat that the second officer and uh, a few other crew members are are riding. It's the very last lifeboat. Uh, it was a reserve boat. They had two reserve lifeboats that weren't hanging over the side of the ship, and both of them they failed to yeah. get off. But this one, they they were still riding. It overturned, all standing on it, to, very very delicately keeping their balance, um, and they find him. And there's no room on the boat, so he just holds someone's hand and 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 stays in the water until they get him onto another boat. Actually, no. Yeah, after somebody else boat. has already expired. Um, somebody has clearly died, so they dump they dump that body and and pull him on board. And then we get one last little bit of comic relief. He hiccups, and everybody looks at him. Because it's you know it's a drunken hiccup and and he says oh oh the cold got to me yeah which like is, and which is amusing off. because the cold should have gotten to him but being drunk out of his yes, mind the cold should have gotten to him. he's got enough yeah. antifreeze in his blood he's drunk enough scotch he's drunk enough scotch that his blood is so thin yeah well he's he's got antifreeze not. now for he blood is. apparently yes he is he has a little bit of blood in his alcohol stream. Um, <laughs> That's the idea. Though, though, uh, he claims that he only drank, I think, in the historical record, not in the movie. Obviously, the movie shows him drinking nearly a full bottle of Johnny Walker. He claims he drank, like, a quarter of a decanter of whiskey. Um, but since he survived two hours in the water. Probably isn't true. Considering, considering how long he survived, that probably isn't true. Uh, there is one other major example of the crew doing the crew's thing. Um, and to keep people from panicking and to keep the rescue efforts going, they've got to keep the lights on, which means they've got to keep the boilers going. Uh, so we've got all of the, all of the men in their white, ja- <laughs> white suits down very far below deck. Well, at, I mean, at the bottom, basically. Probably rooms away from where the actual damage is. So very, very close to being in life threatening danger. Well, and we see that they're in danger. Uh, they're they're just... shoveling coal. Yeah. In water. They are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They are standing in water as they're still shoveling coal to keep those lights on. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, there's a great moment where their, uh, their, uh, foreman, after being told that they need to stay, uh, says, uh, 
that, you know, everybody, everybody stay until I give the signal and then it's every man for himself. Um, and that signal's given, you know, at, uh, yeah, the water's at like <laughs> when chest the height. Water yeah. is basic where they're swimming. Yeah. The water is at chest height when that signal's given. But, uh, but what, uh, what he says then is, uh, I think if, uh, if any of you men feels like praying, go ahead. The rest of you can join me in a cup of tea. Yeah. It's such, such a ridiculous British response. Yeah, but you, you have to see. admire them because no one says, there's no hell no yeah. moment. There's, yeah. everybody does yeah. their no, job. No one there, yeah, no one there runs. They just, they do it. But, you know, we've got this, even as the ship is sinking. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we didn't really say as many examples as I could have. Everybody still believes that the ship is unsinkable, even as the ship oh, is yeah. sinking. And it's not, it's, it's every, when we see that on every level, um, some guys from steerage make it out to the upper deck just after the iceberg is hit, and they start playing soccer with a chunk of ice. So nonchalantly, they just kick it back and forth. Um, and, and in that moment, we get another reminder of the, the breaks between the classes. Uh, somebody on a deck above them, he and his wife are, are walking around, and he looks down, and he says, Oh, that looks like fun. I'm going to go join them. And his wife just says, They're steerage passengers. And he shrugs, and they walk back yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't join them, because he can't. He can't, because well, they're and, steerage. Yeah, we get... The, no we matter get how a, much fun A little bit of a perspective having. on the fact that, you know, the the first-class passengers are as locked in by society as the steerage. I mean, they yeah. he wants to go play yeah, soccer. It's, he cannot. It's, yeah, because he can't interact with those people. And it's, yeah, it's it's very much, everybody's locked into where they are. And that, unfortunately, some of them are literally yeah. locked into where they are. Um, actually, an interesting note on that. Uh, the guy who is, uh, is uh, the officer in charge of keeping the gate that's keeping steerage, uh, the people in steerage on the below decks... Um, the guy who's who's in charge of that lock gate is an uncredited, uh, is it y- Yulin, uh, I can't remember his last name. It's the guy who played Q in the Bond movies, um, up until his death. Um, he's a great actor. He's great. <laughs> and I totally missed too. that. But, uh, yeah. Um, I did catch that, and obviously, uh, the wife of that couple is the woman who played Pussy Galore in Goldfinger. Uh, and one thing I missed, but everything I've read insists is true, uh, apparently, Sean Connery played one of the steerage passengers on credit. I, yeah, I missed that. I did not see that at all. Yeah, so, so I guess, I, so three of our, three of our people on the Titanic come back together for Goldfinger a few years later. <laughs> yeah, right, like. Uh, it's <laughs> interesting, an interesting aside. I like to now believe with our conversation. the Titanic film is actually part of the James Bond canon. Maybe. It's a Maybe secret it mission. Maybe it is. It's a completely secret mission that for some reason Q was <laughs> well, involved you know. with. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to write that <laughs> right. movie. It's hey. like time traveling James Bond. That'll be the next da- the next the next Daniel Craig Bond movie will take that, place on that Titanic. For no readily apparent reason. And, wonderful. And completely break the continuity of the films even more. Be wonderful. As if there's a continuity. Right. Of those exactly. Movies. Death lasers in space. Yeah. Death lasers in space. Right. Um, where were, where were we? And I really, I really love that there's, there's moments where people essentially say everybody knows the ship can't sink, and then we immediately Water cut to the, to the flooding, up, yeah, c- container. compartments. Yeah. And that happens so much. This, this movie hinges so much on dramatic irony. Well, um, it's, yeah, they, it's they, they, they hammer it. Face. <laughs> they hammer it, but it's still well oh, placed, yeah. and it's still great. Um, well, but I think yeah, it was it was very. I mean, it, it is it can be a little bit of a slap in the face sort of experience watching them say like, "Oh, it's unseekable." What are you talking about? And then like it's full of water, but yeah. at the same time, I mean, it it really does show like does a good job of showing these people do not understand. Yeah, it hammers the mentality of yeah. the people we're seeing, and and the fact that this is a historical, uh, 
drama and, you know, very, very steeped in the reality of the situation, we need to understand how deluded these yeah, people Yeah, well, and I, I, you know, in our first take, I brought this up, but recently, as in within the last week, I was reading a article on a shall remain nameless website, and they pointed out that the... <laughs> it was of cracked, course it wasn't was. it? It was cracked. But why did you have to point that out? I don't want to give credit to anybody. Um, but they, they... No, no. We need well, to cite our sources. Yes. Okay, so Wikipedia. Um, no, okay. they mentioned... Like, one of the articles talked about the fact that there's... A, you know, they had pretty good reasons to believe that it was unsinkable. I mean, obviously, to think something is unsinkable mm-hmm. is, you know insane i mean like it can be very 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 hard to sink yeah but they had good reasons because the the, this is the second ship i think it was in the line and they had already built the first one and it had been traveling for a year or so and had been basically spent the entire year running into things that the 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 i think it was the olympia had on its maiden voyage wrecked a whole bunch of ships when it went into port in America, it had, like, basically caused, with its wake, a whole bunch of other smaller ships to crash into its side. And then had gotten later in an accident, in a collision with another cruise liner. And had limped back home after mm-hmm. that. So people had not good reasons to believe it was unsinkable, but good reasons to think, well, it's pretty safe. Yeah. There are good, re- there are good reasons to believe in the system. Until you see the system right, completely exactly. fall apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's that's the problem of humanity, well, and that's the, the point that your <laughs> quote at the beginning was definitely making is that yeah. this all literally, if any one element had been even a little bit different, everybody would have made it home. Yeah. If the Olympia had had any sort of issue, yeah. If they had fire. any reason to think, oh, maybe it will sink. Well, you know, if they had decided to build the bulkheads, the wireproof bulkheads, a little bit higher, it it could be anything. And they just... But that's the thing, is like, you know, you can build backups for your backups, and then you can build backups for your backups for your backups, but that can only go so far. Yeah. That's why you need lifeboats. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And And the ship's designer, I really think... Um, the poignancy with, with with which he accepts the demise of his masterpiece is uh, is beautiful, because he he immediately oh knows yeah, he and he immediately knows he's responsible for everyone being dead. Yeah, and, and it's really kind um, of a sad <laughs> state of affairs he just, because he didn't do anything wrong. You know what I mean? Like yeah, he he exactly. accepts it. It's obvious when you see him. He accepts that this is his fault. Isn't his fault. Yeah. Not really. He built, from what we see in the movie, a very well built ship based on, and that follows a design that had worked perfectly previously. Yeah. And and was even, I think, lauded for having extra safety features that no other boats had at the time, like the waterproof bulkheads. But then. Yeah. And it fails for so many reasons piled up on top of each other that it's not his fault, but he does accept responsibility for it. Which is kind of tragic in itself. Yeah, because it's still his boat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, certainly. He's a very tragic character. He's one of them. Yeah, he's he, the you most know, definitely, yeah. Really, out of anybody in here. Because it is, it is, you know, obviously being the designer, he is, it is his pinnacle, you know, pinnacle. It is his, the launching of the ship is the dream of his life. I mean, not necessarily accurately. Yeah, I mean, he, but, but ta- when we start, he of, takes fantastic pride in it he's going around checking out like the engine room yeah. and having cut co- and like all this stuff yeah. and then yeah. we see that that bubble is completely burst yeah. he knows that yeah. his machine completely killed burst. is going to kill 1700 people or something like that yeah 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 and it is it is his his point of redemption to make sure that as little of that happens as possible, which is why he goes and he tries to convince as many people as he can that the yeah. ship is really going Yeah, he, he does his um, best. So, yeah. So, um, 
and get away from themes a little bit. I would like to talk about this movie on a technical level because it was yes, great. the the the, um, the cinematography and the special effects of this film are magnificent. Yeah, yeah. There are there are moments when when the boat starts to sink, and and I may have mentioned this before. I may not have mentioned this yet. Uh, the ship, uh, their sets are based on the original, the original. Uh, Blueprints for the boat, so um, everything's pretty realistic that way. But the sets are also built on hydraulics, or at least at least quite a few of the ones we see. Um, so there's there's the nursery, and right before the there's, there's a lot of great moments. We cycle through the first class dining room, the kitchen, the nursery, right before the ship hits the iceberg, and we see these very square shots of everything sitting. Everything quietly, is level, peacefully. Beautifully, well, and you level. even even when and the then, captain and the first class passengers are having dinner, they talk about the fact that it's steady yeah. as a rock. They, yeah, somebody balances yeah. a pencil on its eraser, um, because that's how smooth and level the ship is, and how perfect the ship is. And then when the ship starts to sink, we see all of these different places again. And everything's falling off the shelves. This rocking horse that we viewed uh, in the nursery rolls across the room. And it's it's made even more poignant the way it's shot because, uh, like I said, the hydraulics, they could have they could have done, you know, like, they could have Star Trek'd it. They could have... Yeah, <laughs> right. Lean like, left. On the count um, of three, lean left. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But the way it's shot, the it's it's very Cohen-esque, really. The, the squareness of the shots. The very flatness of it, I guess. And Wes Anderson does that a lot, too. Um, and we get this flatness and squareness, and then the room tips. Right, right. Not and the you camera. you feel that the it's room. building. You see, like, oh, my goodness, we're yeah. now at a 45-degree yeah. angle. Yeah. You, it really it feels more like the floor is dropping out from under you than it could have yeah. any other way. Well, and um, I made I made this point yeah. I think in our first take of this podcast, but in my mind, they they I mean the the models they use for the outside are very well done, very nice, very beautiful. But they could oh, yeah. have gotten the point across without ever shooting a single shot of the ship outside. Oh yeah, if they wanted yeah. to, because you get it Just, from the p- way people are inside that we're going down, yeah. and we're going down yeah. quick. The interior shots are great, but the fact that they do. Do those exterior shots is also just amazing because obviously it's got to be a model. They didn't build the yeah, they, entire they, Titanic, and I meant to look this up to see how they did this. But there are a lot of great distant shots of the boat sinking, of the boat half in the water, half underwater. But we've got the lifeboats in the foreground that are clearly live actors. Oh yeah, yeah. Rowan. They've Reacting. somebody did some very fancy technical work to make it that way because yeah. there's no seams or anything. Yeah. There's no cutting there. Like I mean, it's, yeah, it's done so well. It's done it. It's done so amazing. Well, and I think well I there. And Oh yeah, looks, yeah, it looks fantastic. And I think I mentioned this before. Yeah, it looks well, previously. Uh, like one of the ones that impressed me most is when we first see the, I don't know anything about fi- uh, boat terminology. So the front of the ship going completely, completely, yes, completely submerging. Okay, we literally see the water pour yeah. over the sides, and I was really like, sometimes it was pretty easy to tell it was a model, but at that point I was like, is this a model, or did they build a set that was big enough that it looks like an actual boat going underwater? Because you watch. The I guess you said it was the stern going beneath the water, and it's totally yeah. believable looking. There's no, like, oh, man, they just sunk a model look to it at all. It's just a boat sinking, and it's really an impressive effect that they have. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, way shots of the ship sailing that are very clearly a model. Um and they didn't bother to do to do anything fancy with to try and make it. It's like like in that opening scene, <laughs> yeah. of a lady vanishes. Obviously, the whole town is a model, but there's little guys who are they've just taken a, a, a snow fifteen minute yeah a coffee break for shoveling snow where they stand yeah. there holding the shovels. Yeah. Well, but I mean, yeah. I, 
Yes. Car. And then there's that the car that's very clearly pulled across. Yeah, I mean, I'm it's glad terrible. they didn't do anything like that because but, that would have uh, just cheapened the whole affair. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we we don't get the sense that the ship is alive when they do scenes like that, but they're pretty fast cuts, so you're not staring at the boat for five minutes. Yeah. But also, you kind of get this sort of, I don't know what to call it, like kind of a a vision of what the ship is. Like, it, though it's being represented in a model, you get yeah. to see the grandeur of the ship even though it's in model form. And so yeah. it ends up working oh, yeah, out definitely. anyway. Definitely. Yeah. And in, in that way, it's like the opening scenes of Star Wars. I mean, it's, it's very clearly a model, but it's still an impressive model. Right, exactly. It's shot. still pretty. Yeah. Yeah, it's still pretty. Um, and I, I, a really interesting side note, and, and kind of a tragic one in and of itself, uh, some of those shots of the ship sailing were actually stolen from a 1936, uh, I, I want to say, I, maybe 37, yeah. Nazi film about the I think Titanic. it was 38, actually. Um, and they were... St- they, I think it was 38. Huh? Yeah, I think it was oh, 38. I remember reading that. 38. Um, yeah. They they stole those shots. They didn't they didn't credit them. Um, and and in a, an extra moment of tragedy, the guy who made that film, who isn't getting the credit here... Uh, Apparently, uh, Goebbels did not like his Titanic movie because he had him killed in like '39. Yeah, that is that's <laughs> so it was pretty quick turn. Tragic, I don't know but I don't. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 tragic on a different level. <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't know what else. Well, uh, what I mean, else we did I I think we've talked about everything that we talked about in the first take. And we actually have managed to yeah, make a yeah. podcast that is longer than the first take, which is remarkable. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. Yeah, we we really fell sure apart on this there. one. Well, I mean, it'll be shorter because we've got about five minutes of us goofing around at the beginning. But and now we should we we probably shouldn't be talking shop anyway. in the podcast. So yeah, I think that's about everything. No, don't talk shop in the podcast. That is about why everything. One one other thing I mentioned they they hit some of as I mentioned the Strasses they hit a lot of the uh, the. The cultural points. Uh, I didn't mention Ooh, this time yeah. around. Uh, Molly Brown is in the movie, and she's not named in the movie, and she's such a great because she, as herself, is is this because she's American. Um, she is a contrast to this to the British social stratification because she is herself a, a contrast well, to yeah. to any sort of social stratification. She's she's basically, um, you know, she was born poor. Uh, and marries a, a, a man think, who um, strikes it rich after she gets married during the guess the gold rush. Yeah. Yeah, and and becomes this aristocrat in well, in she becomes an aristocrat in, um, in in economic means, but she is most certainly not an yeah, aristocrat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's she's very much she's she's one of the principal, uh, uh, very very pre pre-example of this sort of uh, new money, nuevo riche uh, ideal. She's still very much the woman she was born as. Yeah, she's yeah. Very, she's, she's, a, she's a vulgar. Hilarious. <laughs> she's a vulgar woman. And hilariously so. Um, but she's also rich enough to be in first class. So so it's that, you know, you talked earlier about how this seems so different to us from an American standpoint of, of uh Social stratification, and the only thing first class means is that you have more money nowadays, and that's right. exactly yeah, where she, Molly is. She is that. She, she can afford first class, so she's in first class. Yeah, she and, is and she's a great point <clears throat> But of at contract. the same time, at, at every time she opens her mouth, basically. Yeah, at the end, she. Yeah, at the end, she kind of takes control of her boat, demanding that, that the women on board can do just as well to, to, to row as anyone else, and they need to go back and rescue as many people as they can as the crew of that boat the crewmen put on that boat uh just refuses you know and she she leads a little mini oh yeah she puts him in his place against him it's pretty impressive <laughs> she puts him in his place and they grab and the women grab the oars and they go back and they try to rescue people and it's this great little ending moment uh to to her story um, but also, she she remains that point of contrast throughout, and it's it's really well. Yeah, wonderful. she's she's that um, point of contrast, and it's it's interesting yeah. to see that come, even on it, the lifeboat. It, it's interesting to see that come from such a very yeah. British movie, um, that that our 
our our American Molly Brown, the unsinkable Molly Brown, still makes an appearance and is is very clearly meant as as an ideal. Yeah, she yeah, acts. she's definitely even on the lifeboat is like the point of sanity on the lifeboat, like. Yeah, so. yeah, she is. She is. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. I think that's about it. Um, hopefully. Next time, we'll be talking about The Killer, and hopefully Pat doesn't ruin I, I this take not. this time. I don't want so, to do it uh, again. Pat, good luck doing it right. To the rest of you, good night. Good yeah. luck. God Talk speed. to you again next time. Bless. Uh, try not to die. Thank you.